Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your blessings, your goodness to us. We are grateful that you are such a good God. And as we come before you, uh, we are desirous of understanding your will and how that works out in our lives, that we might find freedom in areas that we have been bound up, that we might understand things clearly that in that clear understanding, we might find the freedom that you died to give us and that is freely available to us. And this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> All right, so much of the, the issues that I deal with when I am counseling with individuals um, has its, uh, has, a, a, a strong correlation to our misunderstanding of one's sphere of action and proper or improper boundaries. Right? If we only understood this well, then we would keep our nose out of so much business, we have no business our nose being in, and and we would recognize that others' noses don't need to be in certain areas, <laughs> right? Uh, and things would work and function much better, much better than what we have, um, we have understood <clears throat> and what we have experienced. So we need to recognize that there are different spheres of action. There is God's sphere of action and in that sphere of action, God takes control of the things that happen in that sphere, and he takes responsibility for what happens in that sphere. And yet, God has given to intelligent creatures their own sphere of action. <clears throat> so I have a sphere of action, you have a sphere of action, and in that sphere, we have been given by God self-government, and so we have been given the freedom to choose, we have been given free will, and so on, and therefore we have personal responsibility for how we act and we behave and what we believe and what we think inside of our own sphere. <clears throat> and God, he, has no responsibility for what happens in my sphere of action or your sphere of action because that sphere is under our control, not his. Now, the question might be how far does that sphere go? Well, it doesn't go very far. <laughs> it doesn't go very far. An individual's sphere of action is completely within their own mind. That's where your sphere, act, sphere of action is. It's completely within your own mind. And that sphere of action does not extend actually even to your body. The mind can never be forced and controlled from the outside, but the body can. The body can be forced, right? Um, and, and so <clears throat> you, can, you can be put in handcuffs and you can be taken somewhere against your will. But nobody can handcuff your mind and take it against your will, right? <clears throat> so nobody is responsible for what happens in someone else's sphere of action we are only responsible for what happens within our sphere of action. And what someone else thinks and what they believe is completely within their sphere of action. And what they say and what they do originates from within their sphere of action. 
and we have no responsibility for what they think, what they believe, what they say, what they do. I want to repeat that because it's really important for us to get it. You have no responsibility for what someone else thinks, what they believe, what they say, what they do. Right? None. It doesn't matter if they're your children, it doesn't matter if they're your parents, it doesn't matter if they're your spouse, it doesn't matter who they are, you have no responsibility for what someone else thinks, what they believe, what they say, and what they do. That's their own responsibility. That's their own responsibility. And God, even he does not enter into their sphere of action and take over no matter how the bad the problem is inside because that's not his sphere of action. It's ours, right? it's our sphere of action. And he created us with a free will and personal responsibility and he respects that. And he will never go against his creation because he never made a mistake in creating. It was not a mistake to give us our own sphere of action. That was not a mistake. That was right. And so nothing that he created needs to be fixed according to how he created it, right? <clears throat> now, when I try to go and enter into God's sphere of action, uh, what are things that are in God's sphere? Is, is time in your sphere or is it in God's sphere? Whose sphere is time in? Well, you exist in the context of time, but who is it that controls time? God, right? So time is in God's sphere. What about space? The space in your sphere is space in God's sphere. God's sphere. What about um, circumstances and situations? God's sphere, right? Uh, what about animals and other things? God's sphere. Other people, is that your sphere? No, <laughs> right? Now, now, what other people believe and what they think is not God's sphere either. And we're gonna, we're gonna get into that a little bit deeper. But if you try to enter off into controlling space and time and circumstances and people and animals and all that kind of stuff, it is not going to work and you are stepping outside of your own sphere of action into God's sphere, right? But neither does it work for you to try to go off and get into somebody else's sphere either. So that you try to control what your child believes or you try to control what your parent believes or what your spouse believes or other things of that nature. Now, yeah, well, we'll get into the details. You, you have questions about, well, what kind of responsibility then does a parent have, <laughs> you know, when it's to the, with the children? It's never to control. It's never the parent's responsibility to control. It's the parent's responsibility to train, not to control, right? So why is it that I would step off into God's sphere and why is it that I would try to step off into somebody else's sphere? Well, it's because I believe that I'm God, right? And if I'm God, then I seek to control, but I'm, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not a respectful God, right? If you're selfish and you're a selfish God, you're not a respectful God. And so I'm going to then try to control things that are outside of my sphere. I'm gonna start reaching out there. And selfishness has boundaries for self, but it doesn't have boundaries for others. 
In other words, I will, I will resist up one side and down the other, anybody coming into my sphere, but I will freely enter into someone else's. Right? Everybody experience that? Yeah? You can even see it from children. Children will resist somebody trying to come in and control them. But they will freely try to control. <laughs> That's right. They'll freely try to control. And we do that as well. We, we try to resist being controlled, but we will freely enter into control. And it, when someone steps out of their sphere and tries to get into somebody else's sphere, then that's going to turn into conflict. And when we try to step off into God's sphere and control what's under his control, that results in stress. Right. So everyone was created with freedom to govern themselves in their own sphere, and so everyone resists being governed or controlled by others. Everyone does. They resist being governed or controlled by others. So when you try to enter into someone else's sphere of action or they try to enter into your sphere of action, there's going to be a resistance to that intrusion, and it results in conflict. Right. This is where conflict comes from. Conflict comes from one person trying to get into another person's sphere of action and the other person resisting that. And then them trying to get into your sphere of action and you resisting that. That's where conflict comes in. So you can never enter into someone else's sphere of action in actuality and they can never enter into your sphere of action in actuality but it sure seems like it, <laughs> right? Doesn't it seem like it, that people can control you and they can manipulate you and they can, they can do all this kind of stuff? Not unless you let them. Not unless you let them, right? So where, how does that letting process look like? Well, if you believe that someone else possesses what you need, Right. So if you need them to accept you, if you need them to be in harmony with you, if you need them to approve of you, if you need them to understand you, if you need them to love you, if they have what you need, you believe, then you will bind yourself to them Right? You'll bind yourself to them, seeing them as your source. And then you will begin to change how you think, how you speak, how you act, according to what you think they want, so that you can continue to receive from them what you think you need from them. That make sense? <clears throat> so it is not that they can actually enter into your sphere of action and meddle around in there. No, it's simply you living by a lie, believing that they have what you need and they control what you need, so you then change yourself in order to match what you think they need in order for you to get what you need from them. It gets really convoluted, you know. Really convoluted, but that's, that's how our sinful nature is. It's really convoluted. So when you try to control what others think and what they believe, i.e. if you try to control what they think of you, <laughs> right? if you try to control what they believe about you or even about any topic that's important to you, well, then you're outside of your sphere of action. And when you try to control what they say and what they do, you're outside of their, your sphere of action. That's only going to result in conflict and it will end up with damaged relationships. This sound familiar at all? To one person. Yeah? Okay, all right. All right, so I'm just, I, I gotta gauge the audience and find out if I'm, if I'm on earth 
or I'm talking to a different species right now. Because <laughs> this, is, this is pretty common human experience. So, when you try to control space, when you try to control time and circumstances, resources, environment, people, possessions, and so on, then you're trying to enter off into God's territory on those things that only he can control. And each one of these things that are out here are like fires with lots of heat and that fire and that heat is threatening to get in in order to burn me. Do I like getting burned? No. Do you like getting burned? No. So what are we going to try to do in order to not get burned? Try to control, right? So we're gonna try to control all of these things so that we don't get burned. Can you control all of these things outside of you? No. So when you fail at doing so, what does that result in? Stress, right? It results in stress and fear. Right? So when you can't control the things that are outside of you and you find yourself vulnerable, now there's fear, there's anxiety, there's worry, there's stress. This is the life that we live when we're trying to control those things that are outside of us. Now, <clears throat> what someone else says and does originates from in their own sphere of action for which I have no responsibility for. But if I believe that I'm God, if I believe that I'm God, then I will try to control what they think and what they say and what they do I take then responsibility for what they say and what they do, right? So if I'm God, then I try to control and I take responsibility for what they say and what they do and it becomes personal, right? It's a personal offense and I can't help but take it personally because now, since I'm God, and I'm supposed to be able to control these things, then it's under my control, right? It's under my control. Well, is it under your control? No, this is just a deception, it's just a delusion. It's not actually under my control. But I take it personally because I think it should be. But even God himself does not enter someone else's sphere of action, neither does he take responsibility for what they do and what they uh, say and what they think and what they believe. Right? He doesn't take responsibility for that. It's their own self-government and it's their own personal responsibility. And so he doesn't take personally what they say and what they do because he knows that is their responsibility. But if, he, if the problem is here and he doesn't have direct access to there, and the problem that needs to be fixed is in there, how are we gonna fix it? Right. How are we gonna fix it? Well, imagine with me that uh, you were driving off in the middle of Alaska somewhere, maybe not even the middle, but the outskirts, and you're maybe a few thousand miles from any, from any sizable town and you break down. And that engine just is not working. And there's a few yurts nearby. And uh, you go tapping on a yurt. And, um, and you find that in one of those yurts nearby, there's a mechanic. Woohoo! But he doesn't have any arms. Right? So he's an armless mechanic. So he's got knowledge, he's got experience, he has been through, you know, and whatever, but he doesn't have arms to really do anything about it. So you and he go walking over to that vehicle and he tells you, okay, well, I want you to turn the starter. And you do, and he listens, and he, you know, he has you do a few other things, and he listens, and he looks around, and he kind of peers around, and he asks you to pull something aside and whatever, and, and he diagnoses what the problem is. All right, so now he knows what the problem is and he knows how to fix it, but he doesn't have any arms. 
So how is this problem going to get resolved? Yes. He is going to tell you what to do and you are going to do it. That's right. So it's your own hands that use the wrench. It's your own hands that loosen the nut. It's your own hands that takes off this piece and that piece and so on. And, and it's you that, that does all of this different work in that process. But you don't have a clue of how to do it. <laughs> And, and you don't have really the strength to be able to do it. But while he doesn't have arms, he has the knowledge and he has the strength that he can impart to you. So this is how the problem's gonna get fixed in our own lives. You see, it's not that God doesn't have any arms, but the problem is inside of our sphere of action. And so it's as if he has no arms in that space where he can just reach in and, and fix the problem. So it's only we that can actually do the immediate fixing components of it. We are told that the expulsion of sin is the act of what? Oh, you don't remember that quote. The expulsion of sin is the act of something itself. The expulsion of sin is the act of the soul itself. Isn't that interesting? The expulsion of sin is the act of the soul itself. So it's only we who can fix it, but we don't know how and we don't have the power to do it. And so it's God who offers to guide us and it's he who offers to empower us so that he leads us step by step in the process of fixing it. We can't do it ourselves. Um, we don't have the knowledge or the power, but we are the ones that has to do the work. And so if we sit around twiddling our thumbs waiting for him to do all the work, nothing's gonna work. It'll just be a failure. And if we dive in it to try to fix the problem ourselves, it's not gonna work, it's just gonna fail too. So we've got the ditch on both sides, waiting for him to do it and us trying to do it, neither of which will work. Because the only way it's gonna work is in a cooperative relationship with him, right? Where we're working together, that's where the success is gonna come. So, while everything someone else says and what they do comes from within their sphere of action for which alone they are responsible, yet those words and those actions come out into God's sphere, right? And it comes into the sphere of others. It doesn't necessarily come into, but it comes in access to the sphere of others. And while God does not enter into their own sphere to control what they think and what they believe and the origin of what they say and what they do, yet what they say and what they do enters into God's sphere and so he must, in circumstances and certain situations and circumstances, do something about the saying and the doing so that he can guarantee this all works out for good. Right? So this all works out for good. He does not intervene inside of the, the person's sphere of action, but he intervenes inside his own sphere of action. Right? So fire has no power of its own to burn. Did you ever think about that? Where, where does any power come from? Where does every power come from? God, right? He's the source of all power. So fire has no power of its own. It is God's power by which fire burns. Yes, God gives his power to fire through predictable laws. And so it's by predictable and it's through predictable laws that he gives his power to fire for it to burn. But God can limit that power when he so chooses 
as was the case with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Right? Animals have no power of their own. They live and they act by the power of God. And it's true that animals are given that power by God through predictable laws, but when God so chooses, he can limit that power so that the animal does not have access to that power to do whatever the animal would have chosen to do otherwise, as was the case with Daniel and the lion's den. People have no power of their own. It is by God's power that people operate, that they live and they function and they do and so on. And it is by God's power that they do that and it's through predictable laws that he gives that power to them but God can limit that power when he so chooses when it's necessary as was the case here with Jeroboam, King Jeroboam when he called for the arrest of the prophet who came to prophesy against his idolatrous altar and it split in half and the ashes flew through it and, and uh, he predicted that this king a few hundred years later was gonna come and burn the pro bones of, the, of his prophets on this altar and, and so on and he's like, arrest that man! And then his arm withers up and he can't bring it back. Why? because it wasn't his own power that he was using to operate that arm. Now God did not intervene in King Jeroboam's mind to prevent him from thinking that. He didn't prevent him from choosing what he chose, but he prevented him from being able to accomplish it in the thing that he was using God's power to control. And when God said, nope, you don't have power for that anymore, guess what? He had no power for that. He couldn't control it anymore. But when that prophet prayed for Jeroboam, God returned power back to his hand and the king could, could use that hand again. And bullets have no power of their own. It's by God's power by which they move. And yes, they move by predictable laws. That power is given to bullets by predictable laws. But when God so chooses, he can limit that power. So when I started trauma surgery rotation at Loma Linda, the team was still talking about that case, that case, you know? There's every once in a while, there's that case that comes in that's just so exciting that months later they're still talking about it. Well, it was only a couple of weeks before I started on the team, but they were still talking about it. The woman, young lady, came into the emergency department in not a good condition. She had apparently broken up with her boyfriend who was not happy with this new arrangement in their relationship or the non-relationship now and while she was parked at a red light or stopped at a red light there near Loma Linda, he had walked up to the vehicle with a gun in his hand and pointed it right through the window at an important part of her anatomy and pulled the trigger. And bullet through window, bullet in head here, bullet out of head here. And you know that there's an important real estate in between here and here, right? And so she was, you know, some people had witnessed that, called 911. He got away, at least for the time. I don't know if they ever caught him or not. Um, but uh, ambulance came and they brought her into the emergency department and you know get her stabilized and then you got to find out what's going on in here so you got to send her into the CAT scan in order to see what's going on so the neurosurgeon knows how they're going to intervene and what this is going to look like but it doesn't look good because there's a lot of really important real estate here and when you're in the emergency department or you're in radiology or wherever you're at, you can have the privilege of sitting back there while the scan is happening and you can watch the images come up as each slice of that scan comes and you, you get to watch it from the top of the head and you see that slice and the next slice and the next slice and the next slice and everybody's waiting for you to get down to those slices where you can see where the, where the, where the trauma was. And as those slices started coming through, pupils started dilating, eyes started getting big and people were looking, they're like, what? 
Huh, no, let's go back. They, they gotta wait for it all to load, and then they can start going back and, and flipping through the, 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 the images. They can't believe what they see. And they, they go back, and they go back, and they go back, and they finally trace the track of that bullet. It never entered the skull. That bullet never entered the skull. It's the softest part, I mean, it's the thinnest part of the skull, and the bullet came right in here, and then it turned, and it went around, and it went around, and it came right out there. As if it was a direct in and out bullet wound, but it never went through her brain. Yeah. Physically impossible. It's impossible for that to happen, but it happened. Why? Because in that moment and in that situation, God said, no, this will not work out for good. <clears throat> this will not work out for good. And it was a testimony to a whole bunch of people in that hospital, and she had a testimony that would be even different than if that guy had come up there and pulled the trigger and no bullet had come out. I mean, you know, God can do that too because the gun's all part of his power too, you know? And so, so that would have been one testimony if he would have been up there and been like, <clears throat> you know, and, and whatever, or, <clears throat> you know? <clears throat> no, not working. But no, she's got scars for the rest of her life. Reminders of the miracle. Right? And story that she can tell and others can be impacted by. But, but, fire that only burns by God's power has burned many martyrs to ashes. Right? And animals who live and function using God's power have killed many other martyrs. And other hands that have moved under the direction of man, but by the power of God, have been used to accomplish great evil in this world. And many, many other bullets that have moved by the power of God through predictable laws have resulted in the injury and death of many, many people. And it's difficult for us to understand why God does what he does. We love the stories where Daniel gets saved from the lion's mouths. We love the stories where Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego get to go walking out of that fire. Four, and then, well, three, then four, then three. <laughs> you know? We love these deliverance stories. <clears throat> but we're not so excited when John the Baptist is beheaded. When James is killed by the sword when John is exiled on Patmos and when millions of martyrs surrender their lives in various different ways. <clears throat> we are like ants with a very limited perspective and a very limited capacity. God sees everything from eternity past to eternity future. And he knows how everything is going to interrelate with each other and how everything turns out. And there is an enemy. And the enemy is seeking to steal, kill, and destroy. And he wants nothing but other than to create havoc and chaos and so on. And there is sin. And that sin is here. And the reason that that sin was not destroyed at the beginning, and the one in whom sin came, was because no one knew what it was. And no one knew how bad it was. And if God would have destroyed Satan back at the beginning, when this whole controversy began and, and sin began to rear its ugly head, nobody would have understood why Satan's complaint was so bad that he needed to die. 
And if God would have put him to death then, others would have questioned whether Satan was right and this was a selfish, arbitrary God on his throne and if anybody questions him, they're gonna be snuffed out. And if the next one questions him, they get snuffed out. The next one questions him, they get snuffed out. Well, nobody can love him. You can't love somebody like that. You can serve them out of fear, but eventually, your fear is gonna fail in disobedience. <laughs> and it's inevitable that you'll get snuffed out. So God is not that way, he can't be that way, and so he had, again, he doesn't argue, so God had to let it demonstrate. He had to let it demonstrate. And the deceptions of Satan were so good, so good, that even the angels in heaven were still having sympathy for him up until the time of Christ's death. So good. They're still confused at that point until he put Christ to death. And then their sympathies were removed. But there's still questions that are left unanswered. And there's still demonstrations that still need to be made. And so we haven't come to the end of this thing yet, although it's coming soon. <laughs> but we are like ants and we can only see till the next blade of grass. And we don't understand why God intervenes in certain circumstances and he doesn't seem to intervene in others. Right. We just don't. <clears throat> but God, seeing everything from eternity past to eternity future, he knows everyone. And he loves each one with a love that would surrender his own life for theirs. And knowing everything he intervenes within his own sphere as he knows is best for his entire creation. And he gives us promises that are sure. And those promises are that all things, how many things? All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. What? Are you serious? All things? Can the death of a loved one in a very tragic way actually ever work out for good? Yeah. Can an injury that leaves you debilitated ever work out for good? Yeah. <laughs> Can what seems to be hell ever work out for good? Yeah, it can, and it will, it will. It's not a question of whether it will or not. I've had people ask me, can it ever be true, can it ever be true that this would work out for good? And my question is, can it ever be true that God's word would fail? No. However bad your situation has been or is, he will only allow it if it will work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And not only that, there's another promise and that is no temptation. That also means no trial, no test, no suffering has overtaken you except such as is common to men. You're not the only one. You're not the other, only one. Others have suffered the same thing too. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. It will not ever be too much. But it sure seems like it. It will never be too much, but it seems like it. But with the temptation, it will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So he who walked in our flesh he who lived our life, he who experienced our suffering, 
He who became our sin. He who paid our penalty. He who understands firsthand our temptations and weaknesses is the one who measures and filters everything that gets to us. Everything. The question is, can you trust him? Can you trust him not just with your hopes of deliverance? Can you trust him with the pain and the suffering that comes? Yeah, there's a lot of bad things that are outside of us. We live in a world where sin has affected everything and the enemy wants nothing less than to use those things in order to destroy us. He wants to turn the heat up so great with those fires that are around us so that he will burn us up. That's what he wants. He wants our destruction and he wants to laugh at God that he wasn't able to save us. And yes, if we were the ones that are in control, we try to keep it all out so that we don't ever get hot, we don't ever get burned. Our measure of success is no suffering. Our measure of success is no suffering. But there's a problem, and that is there's a problem inside of us. And it's not what's outside of you that will kill you. It's what's inside that will kill you. Yeah, something might make you sleep for a long time outside until Jesus comes. But it's only that which is inside of you that will destroy you for good. And that's the real problem. <clears throat> that's the real problem. And Jesus surrounds me with his presence. He surrounds me with his presence and he filters everything from out there. And he measures it all so that what gets in is just enough. Hmm. Just enough for what? The Father's presence encircled Christ and nothing befell him but that which infinite love permitted for the blessing of the world. Here was his source of comfort and it is for us. He who is imbued with the spirit of Christ abides in Christ. The blow that is aimed at him falls upon the Savior who surrounds him with his presence. Whatever comes to him comes from Christ. He has no need to resist evil for Christ is his defense. Nothing can touch him except by our Lord's permission and all things that are permitted work together for good to them that love God. Oh, it's a beautiful passage, I love it. Because it tells me that there's a force field, <laughs> right? It's not, it's not the enterprise. <laughs> And the Enterprise force field where you get enough of those alien ships out there bombarding it and so on and it'll eventually get through. No, it's a force field of God and his own presence who is infinitely powerful and he surrounds you with his presence just as the Father surrounded Christ. But guess what? Did bad things happen to Jesus? Yeah, it did. But did the bad things that happened to Jesus happen for bad or happen for good? For good. And in the same way, Christ surrounds us with his own presence so that nothing can get through him except by his permission. So if somebody comes up to you to boom, that fist has to go through him first. It's gotta go through him first. And if it cannot work, work out for good, and if it's gonna be too much, it won't get through. But if it does get through, it will only get through because it will work out for good, and it's not too much. So there's no need for us in Christ to defend ourselves from anything just as Jesus didn't defend himself from anything. When it came rushing at him, he didn't go running away from it. 
When the demoniacs came, he wasn't getting ready. The disciples, they're gone. And he's just standing there. Why? Because his father was his defense. And that he knew those demoniacs could never get through his father unless his father said okay, and if his father said okay, it would only work out for good. So that problem within us is like a metal, and that metal is misshaped, and it is impure, and it's a problem because it will destroy us forever. And so how are you going to reshape that metal and purify it? Fire. The only way you can do that is to melt the metal and then you can purify it. So in order to melt the metal, you gotta let as much heat in as necessary in order to you, for you to melt it. So all that fire around you is threatening to burn you up, but Jesus surrounds you with his presence, and so he filters all of that stuff that's around you so that what gets through is only what's necessary in order to purify you, not to destroy you. So, if you allow Christ to be your defense, if you allow him to be the one to, and you're trusting in him to take care of all of those things that are around you, he will let through far more than you ever would. Far more. Because you would stop it all. And he's got to let enough of it through so that you can be purified. And people wonder, can I really trust him? Because he's allowed so much through before. Well, yes, you can. It's part of the purifying process. And there's no guarantee he's not gonna let more in in the future unless you're already fully purified. Anybody that way in here? No? All right. Well, then if you're trusting in him, expect it's gonna come. But if you try to control it, you will stress out, you will live in fear and anxiety and worry, but if you let him control it, you know something's coming that you don't want, but you know also it can only work out for good. It can only work out for good. And when you get to the end of it all and you look back, you'll go, oh, praise God, thank you for allowing that to come, right? Now, this sphere of action, let, let's say you've got two people that live in the same house and uh, one likes things clean and the other is a mess. So how do you handle this sphere of action thing when you've got two people in the same home and they've just got two different ways of dealing with things, right? So one is the hoarder and they've got piles of stuff all over here and, and the more dirty it is, the more comfortable they appear to be and the other one is just completely the opposite and they are the clean bug and they want to clean everything and when they start cleaning things, the person who's dirty is not happy because they like their dirty and they like their disorganized organization and <sighs> so, so how do you deal with that? Well, question, who owns the house? Well, if you own the house, then you have the responsibility to make sure the house is good. But who owns the house? God does. That's God's house, not your house, right? So who are you accountable to? You're accountable to God. But what are you accountable for? You are only accountable for your sphere of action. And that sphere is right here. You are only accountable for how you relate to the environment around you you are not accountable for the outcome 
of that relating, right? So, so who has, we can ask the question, who has the delegated authority? Because all authority comes from God, right? So who has the delegated authority? All right, so if this is a, if this is a husband-wife situation in a home, <clears throat> then who has the delegated authority? What's that? Okay, well yes, they have, they have a certain amount of delegated authority but in the context of sin, God has uh, made a tiebreaker because he knew he'd come into these kind of difficulties. There was no need for a tiebreaker before sin because there wouldn't be any arguments. But then God made a tiebreaker. Who's the tiebreaker in the home? The man, right, the husband. So who has the delegated authority? So if the husband is the unclean person and the wife is the clean person and the unclean person wants the house to remain unclean, then there needs to be a conversation of, okay, which of this space is my authority? Right? Which of this space is my authority? Is it this half of the bed? Is it this bathroom? Is it this half of the bathroom? What is it? You know? And if it's this half of the bed and this half of the bathroom, then that's fine. You clean this half of the bed and you clean that half of the bathroom and you, you, you treat it as you would in your responsibility to God and if they claim the rest of the house as their delegated responsibility and they fill it with mess and grime and all that kind of stuff, who are they accountable to? God, not you. To God. You are not responsible for how it comes out. You are responsible only for how you relate to it, right? Within whatever is your sphere of action, right? So you're not responsible for how the house actually ends up looking at the end. You're only responsible for how you relate to the house within your responsibility, within your sphere of action. When you try to step beyond that, now, we get into conflicts, we get into relationship issues, we get into stress, we, you know, and, and things really start falling apart. Why? Because we're stepping outside of our sphere of action. Right. So is it ever good to try to take over someone else's stewardship to enter their sphere of action? No, never even if you're seeking for the good, it's never good to do that. Because God himself doesn't ever do that. If you wanna be a hoarder and you wanna keep the house a perfect mess, that's not what heaven's like. You're not gonna fit in in heaven, you know, with, with that kind of, um, you know, that kind of uh, a love for disorder and other things of that nature because heaven's all about order. You're gonna get there and you're gonna be like, oh no, this is, this is, I'm just, I feel very, very uncomfortable in this, you know, this very orderly place, right? Um, but will God let you be a hoarder? Yeah, he'll let you be a hoarder. You can collect all the stuff you want to. You can leave it as dirty as you want to. God gives you the freedom to do that. So why is it that we can't give them the freedom to do that? Why? because we come at it from a backward standpoint. We see ourselves as God, but we see them as our source, and we've gotta have a good source, and if our source isn't good, then we've gotta to try to fix them. We are not God's source. Oh, he loves us, he died for us, but he doesn't need us, he wants us. And if we go off in a wrong path, he, is a, he, he loves us and he will give us the freedom to do so. Now, when we look at sphere of influence, we need to take consideration of another thing, and that is uh, how does sphere of action relate to laws and authority and penalties and rewards and that kind of stuff. So there are two governments. There's God's government and there's civil government. 
And God's government is a government that rules the mind and the thoughts. It deals with sin and morality. It operates with forgiveness and love. And it deals with things of an eternal reality. Civil government deals with the body. It deals with actions. It, it looks at crime and it makes sure that individuals are civil. It deals with penalties and force and it deals with things that are of a temporal nature. Right. So civil government has nothing to do with whether you hate your neighbor or not. It could care less whether you hate your neighbor or not, just as long as you don't do anything bad to your neighbor, right? God's government, I mean civil government, deals with your bodily threats to somebody else or your actual physical harm to them as well. God's government deals with your mind and your thoughts even if they're never expressed in words or actions. So you may be innocent according to the civil government because all you did was hate the guy or hate the girl, but you can be completely guilty according to uh, God's government because hatred is sin, <laughs> right? Now, civil government has nothing to do with sin. It has to do with crime. It has nothing to do with hatred. It has to do with violence. It has nothing to do with lust. It has uh, everything to do with perverse acts. It has nothing to do with coveting. It has to do with theft. And so the civil laws rule the actions of an individual and how they, how they relate to uh, each other in that manner. But God's law rules the minds, the thoughts, and the motives. So while crime is a transgression of civil law, sin is a transgression of God's law. And you might sin and not commit a crime. Hate your neighbor, but you never did anything to him, so it wasn't considered a crime. But you may commit a crime and not sin. Right? Yeah? You ever heard of a government making laws that went against God's law? And so individuals continued to do what God's law said rather than what the government law said? Yeah, so you would be considered uh, committing a crime by going against what the civil government said, but you were in harmony with God's law, right? So you could commit a crime, but not be, not sin. So the two laws are not necessarily the same. So God's government, again, deals with sin, and it goes to the core of the motivation behind the crime, whether the crime was ever committed or not. And sin can only be eradicated by love, and it involves the forgiveness of the individual through Christ, and grace rescues that sinner from the cause of sin, right? From the cause of the sinful uh, nature. And by setting you free from the penalty and the power of sin, the sinner is rescued. But the civil government deals with crime. The act is committed it's the act that's committed, but not the sin that motivated it that the civil government deals with, and it uses force, and it uses punishment. And civil government will force you from harming somebody, it'll force you to prison, it'll force you to pay a penalty, it'll force you to make wrongs right to the degree that it can force, and it will assure that men are civil whether or not they're moral. But morality, is related to God's law, and that's man's relationship with God. Civility is civil law and man's relationship with man in an outward way. And civil government cannot make a man moral, ever. And it can make sure that a man who is not moral is civil, at least. It doesn't give men its rights, only God does that, but it protects men in their God-given rights. So if men will not be moral, civil government will come in with power and compel those who will not be moral to at least be civil. And that civil government cannot operate on the premise of love and forgiveness. It would not work, right? In sin, you can confess your sin, you can trust in Christ, you can be set free from it, but in crime, you can be as sorry as you wanna be, you still gotta pay the price for the crime, 
You gotta pay the penalty. And there is no forgiveness in the civil government and that's actually a good thing because the whole system would break down if it was. Right? Imagine what would happen if every time you did some kind of crime and you were brought and caught and brought in before the judge and you said, oh, judge, I'm sorry, that was wrong. I, you know, I, I, I apologize. Would you please forgive me? And the judge forgives you and sets you free and lets you go. And the next time you go, you do that crime, you, 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 you know, confess and, and so on and the judge lets you go and the next time you do it and the next time you do it and the next time to do it. Would there ever be anything to defer, deter the criminal? No. I mean, California. I mean, what are they reaping now? The people are walking into stores with calculators because the law says if it's under 900 and some dollars of merchandise, there's no, persecu- there's no prosecution for it. Yeah, persecution. There's no prosecution for it. So they're walking in with calculators and they're stealing stuff and they're calculating the price while they're doing so to find out, make sure that they're under that level and then they walk out with 938, if it's 940, that's the, that's the limit, and they walk out with that merchandise, stealing it, walking it away. Civil government will fall to pieces if there is forgiveness there. And if it operates by love, it can't. But what if civil government tries to get into the thoughts? What if it tries to get into the motives of an individual? Oh. What if everybody who ever lusted, hated, or coveted was thrown in prison? Who would be left to throw them into prison? No. Oh. So the civil government cannot, it must not enter into the thoughts and the beliefs of individuals. And it must not either allow forgiveness. It must allow the penalty to come for the the crime that was committed. Now at its best, the civil government can never make a man moral, loving, or in heart obedient, but God's government can. And God's government, at its worst, he can take the worst criminal and he can purify him so that he never needs the civil government to control his actions ever again, right? His actions are controlled by himself under the influence of the Holy Spirit in accordance with God's law and when, the God's, when God's government fixes a man, it eliminates the need for the civil government in his life. And if we would only surrender and cooperate with God, then there would be no, no, more, no more need for the civil government and those penalties. And yes, God's government deals with things of eternal value, the civil government with temporal things. God's civil government could care less what a man's future plans are. It just wants to know what you're doing today. It has nothing to do with eternal. It has to do with temporal punishments and gifts and so on. So, all right, what does this have to do with sphere of influence? Well, the moral law was made by God himself and it's the standard of government for all creation and everyone that has a moral capacity has the intelligent obligation to live and conduct themselves in harmony with God's moral law. And that's because everything that was created by God to be a part of his kingdom and every creature is a citizen of that kingdom whether they want to acknowledge it or not. And while God will never reach into a man's sphere of action to control where he alone has control, that man is accountable to God for how he behaves. Right? There is an accountability there. But the civil law has no responsibility here, none. But once a man says or once a man does, the civil law does have an appropriate responsibility to restrain the evil of one who would not be restrained by the law of God. That's appropriate. And so that comes into parenting. Anybody ever been a parent? Yeah? Yeah, I got got six. So this comes into parenting. Do you realize that parenting is is not just a God government thing. Parenting is a civil government thing too. If you try to parent only by God's government, 
from the way that God's government goes, you will fail with your children. And if you try to parent them only according to the civil government, you will fail your children. The only way that it will work is if it is an appropriate combination of God's government and civil government in the home. Because your children are born with what? A carnal nature, sinful nature, selfish nature. That nature is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. That nature cannot submit itself to the law of God. And so if all you do in your parenting is love them and forgive them, there will be nothing to take the sinful wayward heart and restrain it from its sinful desires and redirect it in its path. But if all you do is bring punishments for what they say and what they do and you do not have the love and the forgiveness to go along with it, then they have no hope. And all you will do is make them be civil to others and they appear good on the outside while they still hate, they still lust, they still covet, they still do all of that kind of stuff inside. So parenting is both. It has to be the civil government which brings the consequences to the evil that was done but also forgiveness and love in relation to the sinner. It's gotta be both. It's gotta be both, or else it will fail, right? <clears throat> so you are not a bad parent if you bring consequences. You're not. But <clears throat> you are not a bad parent if you love them and you forgive them. But it's got to be both. It's got to be both. Now, if I have no responsibility, this is the last slide on this. If I have no responsibility for what someone else does in their own sphere of action, does that mean I have no responsibility to try to help them if they're deceived and destroying themselves by that deception? No, I do. I have a responsibility, but that responsibility is not to force them to change. That responsibility is to appeal to them, right? And what they say and what they do, what they think, what they believe, those, those things may be self-destructive, and if I see that my brother or my sister is self-destructing by those things, then I, who belong to God who sought to seek and save those which were lost. I am wanting to cooperate with him in trying to reach the one who is destroying themselves. And so with a heart of love for the individual, I will seek to go to them, to appeal to them, to reconsider their destructive thinking that is hurting them and that is hurting others and I will seek to reason with them so that I might try to restore them if at all possible as an instrument of God in their case, right? But if they will not, right, if they will not listen to me and they won't be persuaded, then I go and I take others whom they respect who are also filled with the love of God so that we might surround them with love to reason with them and to appeal with them so that they can come out of that self-destructive thought process. And if they will not, even in that case, then we surround them with the entire church of individuals who heart, of hearts who love them and desire them to be set free. And we surround them with love so that we can try to reason with them in that stinking thinking so that they can come out of that, that thing that they're stuck in. And if they will not, if they will not, then we leave them alone for now. We pray for them 
we desire their best good. We wait for the Lord to allow consequences to come in their life so that he can then help to restore them. And when they're ready to come back, oh, welcome back, brother. Welcome back, sister. Right? That's the true foundation of Matthew 18. We usually have it backwards. We see Matthew 18 as a way of accosting somebody and then putting force and then more force and then more force and if they won't succumb to the force, kick them out. No, it's appeal. It's more appeal. It's more loving appeal. And then if they won't, then you let them have their space until circumstances and situations work out so that they see their need and they're ready to come back. Right. So, what about boundaries? Right. What about boundaries? Well, healthy boundaries are necessary. They're necessary for proper function. They're necessary for proper relationships. And they keep others out of your sphere of action and they keep you out of other sphere of action and they keep you out of God's sphere of action. That's all important, right? Um, but boundaries are, are naturally a part of our perceptions, right? So it, it's, uh, you will put up boundaries or you will let boundaries down depending on how you perceive things. So if you perceive that there's danger, then you can't help but putting up a boundary in order to try to protect yourself. If you perceive that there's no danger, then there's no need for you to put up a boundary. And if you're already protected, well, there's no need for you to go ahead and put up your own boundary because there's already one that's put up. For example, to meet a lion in this situation where you have a fence between, well, that's one thing. To meet the lion with no fence in between, that's another, right? And that's another. So there are unhealthy boundaries, and when we have false perceptions, that leads us to break down those barriers. I try to enter God's sphere, or I enter into somebody else's sphere. That's not good, that's bad, bad. And I try to keep others out of my sphere, but I freely enter into theirs, and I break down appropriate boundaries because, well, I'm God, <laughs> right? So if those boundaries are to protect myself, then they'll always end up harmful. If the boundaries are to protect self, it will always be harmful, always. Because the motivation is selfish, it's for self. And selfishness never turns out well at the end, even though it seems good at the time. So are you your own? The answer is no, you're not your own. So you can never do something for yourself in actuality because you're not your own. You can't, it's impossible. You cannot do anything for yourself because you are not your own. Doing something for yourself is only the result of a deception thinking that you are your own. Right. So are boundaries appropriate in ministry and mission? Yes, absolutely. Jesus had a mission given to him by his father and he had boundaries to protect that. He told his parents, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Boundaries. He told his <clears throat> brothers, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I'm not yet going up to the feast for my time has not yet fully come. Boundaries. To his mother and his brothers, he said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, here are my mother and my brothers for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my mother and sister and, and my brother and sister and mother. So yes, he had boundaries. And he had boundaries for his mission. And you belong to God, you don't belong to yourself. So you have no right to allow others to divert you from God's will and his plan in your life, right? Sometimes we don't think of it from that standpoint, but you don't have a right to allow others to divert you from his plan. You belong to him, you don't belong to them. 
So in Christ, you will have boundaries to protect God's will and his plan for your life, but you always have them with the utmost respect and gentle firmness. Jesus was always respectful, but he was gently firm, and you couldn't budge him. Couldn't budge him. But Jesus never put up a boundary to protect himself. Never. He knew his father already set up that boundary so he didn't need to put up one for himself. Then the detachment of troops and the captain of the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. No boundaries. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? No boundaries. Do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? No boundaries. Then they spat in his face and beat him and others struck him with the palms of their hands saying, prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? No boundaries. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. No boundaries. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand and they bowed their knees before him, mocked him, saying, Hail the king of the Jews! Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. No boundaries. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and power to release you? Huh? Pilate, do you think you have that power? Really? <laughs> You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. They crucified him. No boundaries for himself. Remember, Christ surrounds you with his presence and nothing can get to you except by his permission but whatever he permits, he only does so if it will work out for good in the end and it won't be too much. You can trust him. That doesn't mean it won't be painful. It doesn't mean that things will always go the way that you would like them to, but you can trust him. And it is a people who will still hold on even though it appears that he slays us that will go through to the end. Because we have learned that we can trust the wounds of a friend rather than the kisses of an enemy. Right. <clears throat> Tough stuff, but we gotta see it. If we don't see it, we're just gonna continue questioning why? Why me? Why this? Why the other? No, he loves you. And he's only allowing it because He's desperately trying to save you and set you free. Right. It's for love that he does it. It's for love. Even though in the meantime we might see it as an enemy's hand. No, it's a hand of love. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your blessings. Thank you that you are a God of, a wonderful God, and you know your boundaries, and you know ours. And Lord, teach us that we might know our boundaries too, and that we might trust and hope in you, and that we might stay out of your realm, and we might stay out of the realm of others, for we've got enough in our own to deal with. And Lord, help us to remember that you surround us with your presence and we can trust what you allow through because it will be for our good, 
for our salvation, for our purifying. It's not because you don't like us, it's not because you've cast us off, it's because you love us and you see in us something valuable, worth purifying. We pray this thanking you for seeing such value in us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.